I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Katora. Uh, Dr. Michael Katora is a materials engineer at LSP Technologies, where he plays a integral role in LSPT's Materials Science Center of Excellence, uh, which has a wide range of uh, testing equipment, measuring equipment. Uh, Michael actually earned his PhD from the University of Cincinnati under Dr. V.J. Vasudevan. And I welcome you back, Michael, and I'm turning the floor over to you and look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Katura, as David explained. I'm a materials research engineer here at LSP Technologies. And today I'll be talking about laser peening of additive manufacturing components. So uh, in this presentation, I'll keep it brief, just a quick um, introduction to laser peening. Then I will move to additive manufacturing challenges and how laser peening can be used as a post process. Um, then I will move to a case study that uh, LSP Technologies and Nair uh, performed on additive manufacturer TIE64 and ending of course with your questions. So very briefly, uh, talking about the laser peening process, as you guys are very aware of, in laser peening, we use a pulsed laser uh, when that laser hits the surface, it generates a plasma. The transparent overlay is what confines the plasma. And the name transparent because it is transparent for the laser, meaning you don't lose much energy going through it. And mainly we use water for it. Uh, the transparent overlay confines the plasma, pushing the energy from the plasma into the material, creating a shock wave. That shock wave is what generates the compressive residual stresses. And in my talk yesterday, I explained all the great benefits of the compressive stresses from the laser peening process. An optional overlay is the opaque overlay or tape. And in the case study, I will elaborate a bit more around what we're trying to do with that one for additive manufacturing study on titanium. So let's talk a bit about additive manufacturing. Um, Different additive manufacturing techniques have different problems. As you guys all know, the majority of the additive manufacturing techniques result in components that have challenges to their fatigue life. Uh, for example, for powder-based uh, additive manufacturing, you have major surface defects in the form of unfused powder layers, high porosity, and even inside the material, you have, still have voids. All of these are crack initiation sites. In addition, the additive manufacturing technique itself generates high tensile stresses. So when you put these two factors together, that is the reason why additive manufactured components tend to have much uh, lower fatigue life compared to traditionally manufactured parts. To combat that and to enhance the fatigue life a bit, a lot of post processing techniques are being used after an additive manufacturing process. Uh, for the most two common ones are a hipping process and the heat treatments, and these come with their own challenges. In addition, there's a lot of work around post-processing techniques used to reduce your surface roughness, like machining and milling and chemical reactions. And the goal there is to reduce the surface roughness to enhance the fatigue life from them. So why is laser peening a great post-processing technique for additive manufacturing? Well, the driving force behind the concept of laser peening as a post process for additive manufacturing lies in the, in the concept where laser peening is actually replacing those detrimental tensile stresses that are generated from the additive manufacturing process by beneficial compressive stresses that actually enhance its fatigue life. So with that being said, now you have compressive stresses that reduce the failures from the crack initiation and crack propagation from those voids or pre-existing cracks at the surface or the near the surface. And yesterday I explained the, uh, the, the concepts behind uh, how laser peening can help with that. So laser peening can be applied to the critical areas of components to enhance the full component performance, mitigating different types of failures. There's two approaches for laser peening in additive manufacturing. You could use laser peening as another post-processing, meaning in conjunction with other post-processes uh, similar to what I'll be presenting in the case study, where laser peening was used after hipping. Another approach, you can use laser peening as a standalone post-processing, eliminating the need for other post-processes. Botang in the following presentation is going to explain the work 
that I did when I was back at UC and uh, on uh, applying laser peening on as built additive manufacturer parts. But in general, the benefits of laser peening are obtained in additive manufacturing parts, regardless of what additive manufacturing technique you're using. So uh, let's talk a bit about uh, the project between LSP Technologies and Nair. Nair is the National Institute for Aviation Research, which is also in collaboration with, with Wichita State University. The goal of this study is to investigate uh, the enhancement in the life using laser peening on additive manufactured TI-64 after hipping. And the goal here is to compare it with machining, a commonly used post process in additive manufacturing. So to talk a bit very briefly about TI-64, you guys are very familiar that TI-64 is a commonly used alloy in aviation, but also it's one of the most versatile alloys that you can use and it's being used in a long list of other applications. So actually in the additive manufacturing field, there's a lot of interest around TI-64 and enhancing its properties and so on. So the samples for this testing was actually uh, printed at Nair using direct metal laser sintering using a powder bed fusion. And the samples here as shown in the, the built layout. After printing, they were uh, hipped and the conditions for the hipping, which is hot, hot isotropic pressing, is shown in the table below. So let's talk about machining. As I said, we're going to be comparing laser peening to machining. Uh, machining in this case was milling. And the goal here is to, in order to remove the surface defects and enhance the surface roughness of the part in order to enhance the fatigue life. So as I explained before, a lot of uh, additive manufacturing processes have kind of a machining or material removal as a process process. And in this case, we're trying to compare laser peening with a machining, which is milling of these samples. These samples are Harshi bars, which are used in a four point bend test and that I'll explain. So now let's talk about the laser peening process and what we were trying to do. As I explained, there's this optional OPEC overlay for all alloys outside of titanium, actually in industry, we no longer are using the tape because the taping process is slowing down your processing uh, throughput, meaning you're slowing down your process. The only exception where you need an opaque overlay, in this case tape, is when you're working with titanium. And the reasoning there is when the plasma interacts with the titanium surface, it actually creates an alpha case. The alpha case is a brittle, have micro cracks, and these ones are uh, causing the life of the component to have less benefit from the laser peening process. So the two conditions that, for each condition we have five samples are bare or laser peening without coating. And you can see the oxide layer generated by the laser peening process. On the other hand, you have here samples that were taped. But unfortunately, because of how rough the surface is after 3D printing, the tape wasn't adhering properly to the surface. So when you break the tape, as if you don't have any tape, you're actually creating the plasma interaction with the surface and you're burning the surface, meaning you're creating the alpha case. So the first set of results that I'll be presenting is surface roughness. Uh, every time uh, someone from the additive manufacturing field contact us for performance behavior, the first question is, how does that laser peening process you're talking about affect your surface roughness? Well, laser peening does not change your surface roughness. It actually increases it slightly, around one micron RA, which is average roughness, if you look at it. And as I explained, machining is mainly used to drop the surface roughness and get, off, get rid of your surface defects. So your surface roughness has dropped around two magnitude, two orders of magnitude below the original condition. And that's why a lot of manufacturing processes using uses ma ma machining as a post process. The results that I want to show is residual stresses. I've been preaching about compressive stresses from laser peening for a while. So let's look at residual stress data. Uh, because the baseline samples have been hipped, meaning 
you have relaxed all the residual stresses from the additive manufacturing process itself, you end up with almost a net zero residual stress for that hip condition. However, when you're machining, you're creating a heat affected zone that actually created really high tensile stresses, at least in the 90, direct, 90 degrees direction, which is the long direction of the sample. Uh, that being said, both conditions for laser peening generated really high compressive stresses, high magnitude, high depth, 0.84 bare peening, around one millimeter and a bit more for tape. So it becomes, where do you put your bet? Better surface roughness or compressive stresses? So looking at the actual benefits for any process is when you're looking at the fatigue life and the four point bending fatigue testing shown here in this image was actually done at Meyer. And they used, because we have very limited number of samples, we use a fixed peak stress of 70 KSI, which is 480 megapascal. So all samples were tested at the same constant uh, peak stress. And these are the results. As I said, we're comparing laser peening conditions to machining. Laser peening with tape provided around three times average improvement of life. And it, it provided, these are five points, so it provided very consistent results there. Bare processing or processing without opaque overlay provided much higher average, but it gave rise to a much higher variability, which I'll discuss in the next few slides. But in general, for both cases, laser peening in all samples provi provided much more benefit than machining. And again, we go the same idea. The compressive stresses that you generated from the residuals, the compressive stresses that you generated from the laser peening process itself is the driving force why laser peening is a great bus process for as built uh, additive manufacturing, and it pr pr provides much more benefit than even other post processes like machining in this study. So I'll take the last few minutes of the talk to talk about this variability. If you look at actually the numbers for each one of these samples, the bare samples performed somewhere between four times life improvement compared to machine up to 20 21 times, which is more or less equal to taping and even much higher. So what's the reasoning behind that variability? And to answer that question, we had to dig in into the fracture surface analysis. So we're looking, we looked at fracture analysis uh, of the fracture surfaces and also the edge or side surfaces in order to have the full picture. So the summary and really quickly is for the machine samples, we, we saw multiple surface crack initiation sites. If you looked at the surface here, there's a lot of voids still at the surface, and these were initiating the cracks that caused the failure. For tape, we also saw in surface crack initiations. But if when we looked at the actually where those initiation sites were linked, the, because of the misprocessing and break of the tape, uh, the initiation sites actually took place where we burned the surface and created the alpha case. So even the misprocessing of uh, laser peening with tape still gave much higher uh, benefits there. The final condition, which is the bear, which showed a lot of variability is the actually a really interesting one. The failures were seen in two conditions. There were no longer failures at the surface. So we shifted the failure mechanism from a surface crack initiation into a sub crack in some of the samples. And it actually, it happens to be around 0 0.77. And when I showed the residual stress data, it was around 0 0.8. So to tell you that actually the laser pinning process shielded the surface and pushed the crack failures to subsurface. On the other side, it failed at these corner or edges, which had a features that doesn't show much here. It had kind of a notch like um, features. So in brief, Rather than actually being a problem with the processing itself, the fact that we shifted the failure from a, from a surface to somewhere else, that gave rise to a much variability in the additive manufacturing part itself. The additive manufacturer part had defects and with really high variability that caused a variability in the life that we got from the fatigue testing. The last slide is the future work. 
as you saw, I was comparing laser pinning to machining, but we are continuing the, this work and the goal is also to compare laser pinning to the as printed condition and other post processes. Additional research around laser pinning by itself as a post process, so getting rid of the hipping process or in, co in conjunction with other processing maybe laser pinning after machining is something we're interested in. The last two things are actually improvement on the processing from the laser pinning side, meaning using different OPIC overlays. Tape wasn't adhering well, but there's paint, there's our patented rapid coater and other OPIC overlays that can work wonders on additive manufacturing. And the final part is trying to understand and control that variability in the pair laser pinning process. With that, I'll leave this slide, which is the contact information for laser pin for LSP Technologies, and I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you, Dr. Katora. Really appreciate your presentation. We do have time left over for some questions, which we do have in front of us. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the questions. If there are others, please send them in through the chat, and we'll read those off and allow Dr. Katora to answer those. Uh, the first question I've got is, what happens if you work with alpha titanium alloys instead of the beta titanium alloys? Any chance of beta transformation? That is a tricky one. I have to go back to my phase diagrams to try to understand uh, the transformations there. So I do not have the answer on top of my head. Uh, but in general, Ti64 is a combination of alpha and beta of phases. I'll have to get back to that. Please yeah. say I guess the question really is, is the pulse duration long enough to allow the transformation to occur and the pressure associated with it? Um, can you create that transformation? And I think if I refer back to some of the uh, work that Alan had shown when he was talking about the historical aspects, he did talk about uh, trying to look at creating phase transformations in some of the alloys and wasn't able to do that. So I think it's a good question. Um, I think there was some other work that was showing that there was some phase transformation. So there, uh, at least from one of the talks yesterday or maybe early today. Uh, the next question I've got is, um, have you looked at the near surface structure of a sample that's been LSP uh, treated without tape? And what do you see? Uh, it's really complicated. The answer to that is, this is something we're really interested in. Uh, the fact that we didn't use tape in the first place, would, you would assume everything becomes an alpha phase, but the results doesn't show that behavior because we didn't have failures initiating from the surface. We're really interested in having a microstructural analysis to see did the consecutive shots from laser peening break that alpha case is something in the processing when you're processing the full surface with pulses and the interaction of the different pulses what does that have an effect on creation of that alpha case? So it's something we're really interested in, but we're still in the process of looking into it. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, the next question I get, got is, could you explain more about why the fatigue resistance is better for LSP without coating than with a coating? Yes. Uh, so it, it goes back to the previous question where for when we're generated a burn of a single shot, we still were able to generate an alpha case that forced the failures to be a surface failure. Whereas when we surfaced or treated the entire face without any outback overlay, we no longer saw that type of behavior. And that's where the answer of the previous question came in. Uh, we don't understand what happened to that alpha case. So did we just got rid of the entire alpha phase by ablating it or completely cracking it and make it un, uh, non-effective. So a lot of things needs to be answered before fully answering it, this aspect. We need to understand what happened to the structure at the surface in order for me to completely answer it at this point. But from a fracture mechanics, the bare sample no longer showed that surface failures, meaning we protected that full surface, and that's how we got our benefit. Great. Thank you, Dr. Katora. We're out of time. Um, I know we've got a couple other questions here, but we'll allow those individuals to follow up with you and have those conversations. I really appreciate what you've done and presented here today. It's uh, important in helping to share the information relative to the work that others have done and what you have done. So thank you very much. And we're gonna end this session and then begin the next one. Thank you very much.